Hello everyone, today's episode is with Eric Voorhees from Shapeshift, and um, we talk about governance primarily, um, and in the context of um, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, and the tough thing with all of this is that, you know, you have just a very polarized environment where you have the BTC, r slash BTC community, the r slash Bitcoin community, they're polarized, there's censorship happening, and with any kind of governance thing, you need to be doing your sense making in a really good way, your information inputs, before you make your decisions. Um, so we talk a lot about that, and thinking about, and, and Eric and I kind of go through some of these different options, thinking about how to solve um, these governance problems. We talk about kind of four different things. The first is just emphasizing that, yeah, you really need to do this sense making first. And what that means is that if you're a person trying to do governance, you should be curious first. You should be an empathetic, compassionate, patient listener, um, even if they aren't. Uh, you should seek first to understand, then to be understood. So really kind of push yourself to be a person who actively is curious about the other side and actively is curious about what they have to say. Um, and eventually that'll come back around and I'll be curious about what you have to say. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is around um, this this shared outcome idea. And, and Eric and I were talking about how it's kind of sad because you know he's really aligned with a lot of these people in the Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash communities, but um, because they all want to kind of replace crypto or replace fiat with crypto, but you know that part of the conversation doesn't even happen. Um, so when you're doing this, when you're trying to do the sense making, when you're being curious about the other person, ask them, well, what are your goals? Okay, so it seems like we might be misaligned. You know, you're more into Bitcoin or not more into Bitcoin Cash or whatever, but to check, are we both aligned around like crypto replacing fiat or like, so being able to kind of go up those meta levels and whys and asking five whys for people, then you can find the goal alignment around things. And, and the whole idea here is, you're trying to take these two, lots of things have two sides of a, of a coin, and you're trying to take those, that polarization or that dichotomy and turn it into like a synthesis or a dialectic or a tension or a dance or a balance. Um, so take the polarization and turn it into kind of go one level up and find where you can find alignment um, with that abundant win-win mindset rather than the scarcity trade-offs win-lose mindset. So then the third thing that we chat about is um, yeah, around how to kind of signal that one could be trusted in this. Um, and this gets into the concept of um, making a profit. And a lot of people will talk to Eric and say like, oh man, you're bad because you're running a company, you're trying to make profit and that's why, um, and that's why you're doing what you're doing. And I think that um, that in and of itself is not a good mindset, but also the mindset of just trying to optimize for profit is not great either. And this gets into my ideas around the crypto pledge and how you should try to have this non-accumulation mindset um, because it you know there's this funny thing where it's like trying to maximize the value you give to the world is awesome you should do that give value to the world give value to the world but remember two things a that as you're giving that value to the world when you're getting money in return um, you could become rich and you can get more rich by selling to more rich people so you could say oh man I made so much money but actually you're just selling a bunch of yachts or whatever um, and then second the thing to remember is that the 45 at $45,000 per year after that point money has diminishing returns with respect to happiness so if what you're optimizing for is happiness then yeah try to maximize your value to the world but then as you allow it to you know that money to flow into you as you're giving value to the world instead of allowing that money to accumulate on you instead allow it to flow through you um so yeah that's this concept of the crypto pledge so i might i agree with eric that um trying to make a profit isn't bad in fact it's pretty good to try to produce lots of value for the world but you should also be aware of how rich people can pay for your value versus poor people and how you should allow money to flow through you rather than accumulate on you especially if you're optimizing for happiness and not something else um i don't know what else you'd be optimizing for um, <laughs> Then the final fourth piece that Eric and I talk about is around kind of going back to these pieces above where it's like, hey, if you're trying to be curious, if you're trying to be empathetic, how do our current mediums and our current language, how do they fit and control and change our thoughts and our ability to do those things? Um, and so right now, do we think that we have like a Twitter optimized for curiosity? Probably not. Um, and a good example of this is like, you know, recently Twitter went from 140 characters to 280, and I actually thought that, that was a good thing because it allowed for a little bit more, when people get in debates on Twitter, they can say a little bit more and say, hey, I hear you, thank you for your comment, blah, blah. Adding those kinds of wrappers around your stuff allows it for just, it to not be like total just debate. Um, so 
that's kind of part of this big macro idea around these new protocols for language. Um, and we can imagine giving ourselves boxes that force the curiosity, that force the empathy. Um, and you can imagine them kind of like Mad Libs, kind of like a Mad Lib for nonviolent communication or whatever. Uh, you know, as violent communication is to the physical world, nonviolent communication is to the digital world and to the attention economy. Um, so there's that side of things like the protocols themselves that I'm excited for people to start developing around what Mad Libs and what boxes people can put stuff in. And then in addition to that kind of deeper protocol layer, there's the layer kind of above it, which is this like hashtag meme emoji layer, which is the layer of, hey, what kinds of things can we put in those boxes? And when you think about that, you're like, okay, what would be the best, you know, hashtags and memes to kind of spread through the ecosystem? Um, so I think having at those two layers, it would be really helpful as we develop these new kind of social um, protocols on the internet is to say, hey, what are we trying to optimize this for? And if we're trying to optimize for something like empathy or curiosity, then how can we make it so that the structure and the medium of the environment is optimized for that? And how can we make it so that the words that are being used are optimized for that? I like to imagine this as a blockchain-based Esperanto that's optimized for curiosity or empathy because you can get a bunch more early adopters to get into your system. Unlike Esperanto, Esperanto wasn't able to do this, but with blockchain-based incentives, early adopter incentives, you can get more people into your system and create a language that is more optimized for no more good for the world. Um, finally, you can imagine this same system instead of in the written form, in the vocal form, where you make a one-to-one -one protocol, kind of like pen pals for the internet, um, where people are connecting with people from the other side, optimizing for empathy, and then in those conversations, they are safe, curious conversations. So this is all to say that uh, this, this governance thing is tough, especially because the sense-making side of things is really difficult. And, and right now we're in a situation where essentially the internet optimizes us for polarization and nonsense sense-making, and we're, we're built around um, this accumulation mindset where people are confused around why other people are operating and are you just operating for profit and our language is, is from the 1600s so um, I think if we change all of those things we'll be able to do better sense making which will bit give us better governance. Uh, one final note is uh, a company that Eric is an advisor of, KeepKey, and um, that they just, uh, Shapeshift just acquired is going to be at East Denver and they just added ERC20 to the um, their hardware wallet and they're going to have a bunch of awesome bounties at East Denver which is February 16th through 18th. So um, definitely hope to see you there. Okay, everybody, goodbye. And enjoyed this episode with Eric Voorhees. Hello, listener friend. My name is Reese Lindmark, and you're listening to another episode of Creating a Humanist Blockchain Future. And in this podcast, we take a systems thinking approach to doing good in the world, and we kind of have a couple different series that focus on different system scopes, and today we're focusing on Series A, macro systems. And these are kind of humanity-level systems where we look at trends in our macro-philosophical technological future, uh, where we ask the question, where are we as humanity headed? And specifically today, we're going to talk about Bitcoin dynamics with Eric Voorhees. And Eric is the founder and CEO of Shapeshift, a digital asset exchange that has, and he's been deep into cryptocurrency sphere since 2000. 2011. Eric, thanks for being on the show and welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, excited to chat. Um, so before we chat about Bitcoin dynamics, um, could you give us a high-level overview on your work um, with Shapeshift and also interactions with like Salt and KeepKey? Yeah. Uh, so as you mentioned, I've I've been down the Bitcoin rabbit hole since 2011 and um, been involved with a number of projects from BitInstant to Satoshi Dice. Uh, but for the last three and a half years, uh, have been running Shapeshift. And um, Shapeshift is essentially a way to turn one digital asset into another uh, as quickly and easily and securely as possible. So that was kind of a, a small little project a few years ago when Bitcoin was 98% of the market. But now that there are thousands of these assets, uh, a couple dozen of them with with values over a billion dollars, um, Shapeshift's become, I think, <laughs> fairly central to the to the ecosystem and um so sh we've been growing very quickly we we recently acquired uh keep key which is a one of the three hardware wallet companies uh so keep key allows you to hold crypto assets like bitcoin on a usb device so offline um, and it's a very easy and secure way to hold crypto and then i'm also on the board of salts which is a lending platform um, where people can loan their crypto assets like Bitcoin and get fiat uh, in their bank for the duration of the loan. 
And what that means is that they can get cash without having to suffer a tax event by selling their their assets and without um, and they don't have to worry about missing the upside of the uh, of the crypto. So Salt will launch uh, within a couple months, and um, those are sort of what I'm what I'm involved in right now. Cool, exciting, and and I love what you say there about you know when you started Shapeshift and when you guys created Shapeshift a couple of years ago. Bitcoin was 98% of the market and it was like, whoa, what's happening here? Especially for like you, it's like, isn't Eric supposed to be a Bitcoin maximalist? And it's like, wait, wait a second. They're all complementary to each other. We can have lots of different tokens here uh, and, and make this new cryptocurrency world. So yeah. with that kind of as a backdrop, let's dive into uh, the most recent news on the Bitcoin side. And, and especially just for both you, Eric, and for our listeners to know, this is, for me personally, as Reese, I know not that much about Bitcoin and the dynamics, both the personal dynamics and the game theory dynamics. Um, so I think it'll be, hopefully today, we're going to be coming at it from a first principles perspective um, and, and hoping to get some unity or clarity around, around the situation. So I guess with that as a backdrop... Um, you know, uh, Eric, could you tell me a little bit about, you know, first the past, um, I want to talk about the future in a bit, but first the past around kind of, uh, you know, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash and and why Bitcoin Cash was created uh, a couple months ago. Yeah, so th- this is a, uh, <laughs> a deep trail through the dark woods of crypto here, but um, Bitcoin for a long time has had a scaling challenge. And what I mean by that is that um, the network as it exists currently can only process roughly three, per- three transactions a second. So what happens if four people per second want to use it? Uh, and the answer is that they all cannot. And mm-hmm. three transactions per second is pitifully small for a global financial foundation. Um, so the good news is there's a number of ways that this can be addressed. The bad news is people disagree on how to do it. And the real bad news is that people have, for whatever reason of social psychology, uh, turned into essentially warring religious factions um, on the question of how to address the scale. So um, it's gotten really bad, and it is really you know Bitcoin's biggest obstacle at this point. You, bigger than the scaling problem itself is this problem in the community of people just vilifying each other because they disagree on these stupid technical points. Um, and so, you know, long story short, this issue has gotten worse and worse, and um, multiple factions have all kind of splintered out of what used to be a very cohesive community with a lot of camaraderie and friendship. Um, and uh, it got so bad that a contingent uh, forked off of Bitcoin back in the beginning of August, um, and they said, you know, enough is enough. The status quo is not working. Something needs to change, and so we are going to change it. So they changed the what's called the block size uh, in Bitcoin's code, and since that is an incompatible rule change, the network forked. And so I think this happened on August 1st of this year. So on July uh, 31st, there was one Bitcoin, and then the next day there were two. They, they split apart. And then you had a bunch of people using one side and a bunch of people using the other. Um, and basically, if you had Bitcoin the day before, you now had one Bitcoin on each of these different versions. So the, the status quo chain is is just still called Bitcoin. The forked version that had the change of rule is called Bitcoin Cash. And Bitcoin Cash is uh, very similar to Bitcoin, except that it has eight megabyte blocks instead of one megabyte blocks, which means that it can handle you know, eight times more transactions per second. Um, And that's really the, that's really the difference. Uh, So now the warring tribes have their own, uh, their own cryptocurrencies, which uh, makes them even more prone to, to bicker and argue. Um, And there's, you know, even though Bitcoin cash is, is, you know, a, a 10th of the uh, value and community size of Bitcoin, um, the, that minority believes that it is carrying on the quote-unquote true vision of Bitcoin and that it will someday uh, overcome Bitcoin in the marketplace. And um, so that's kind of the current situation. Yeah. And it's a big mess. 
that's a, I, but I, I think that's a great overview um, into it, both saying it all starts scaling. And it's funny, as you say, because there's good news, which is like, we can scale, you know, and, and the bad news is, is how um, intense people get. And I know for me personally, that was something that I personally felt while, you know, I, when I was first getting into cryptocurrency, it was like, I didn't know really the difference uh, between, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum and all these different coins. And, and for me, I felt that from the Bitcoin community, unfortunately, at the beginning was this kind of toxic kind of ad hominem um, <laughs> uh, environment. And I was like, I don't know if I want to really be part of this uh so so it's yeah. it's maybe turning away some of um at least one random young mind in the space and maybe other bright young minds in the space too yeah i think the the culture of bitcoin became really monotheistic um and rejected uh any suggestions or ideas outside of a very narrow view set and that view set is basically the way Bitcoin currently works is how it should be, and any change that is done requires years of planning and specifically requires the endorsement of the core developers, which you can think of as kind of the, the priesthood of, of the original Bitcoin. So if the core developers don't like something, it's not going to happen in Bitcoin, and if they don't like it, uh, a whole mob of people are going to go around yelling that anyone who suggests that thing is an enemy of Bitcoin. Mm. Um, and you can imagine that that really drives a lot of people away. Um, it drives people to other coins. It drives them to go try their own thing. And, and sadly, it probably drives some people just away from cryptocurrency entirely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the, you know, the Ethereum community is not at all like this. The Ethereum community is still very open, very welcoming, very eager to try new ideas. And, you know, if I'm going to play devil's advocate here for a second, yeah. um, it is, there is a reasonable argument that Bitcoin should be extremely monotheistic, mm. um, that it shouldn't try to do anything strange, that it is sort of the original coin uh, if it changes any rules, that should be done extremely carefully and only after, you know, all the people that really know it best have, have endorsed that. Um, and what that means is that Bitcoin is going to move very slowly, if at all. Um, and maybe that's what it should do. Maybe it, maybe it should be slow moving. Uh, and other coins can try out the more experimental stuff. And, and really, we're not going to know what the right answer was until we have the hindsight of several years. Yeah. Well, I think that that's a good point that... And I can agree with you that uh, a coin moving more slowly with its scaling or other upgrades can make sense. Um, and you, but the, hopefully there would be the ability to do that without um, some of the toxicity. So I guess yep. let's talk about um, the, uh, something that was fascinating in this space was just recently uh, you plus some other kind of leaders in the Bitcoin community um, said you know, there was going to be this thing called segwit 2x um and you guys actually said no we're not going to um push forward the segwit 2x thing could you i guess tell me a little bit more about what is segwit 2x and then uh you know what why did you just what was what, what, why did you guys say no to this and, and what was that like yeah so you know go back go back in time a, a little bit and you you get to you know i'm oversimplifying it here but two camps one of which wanted to scale Bitcoin by increasing the block size from one megabyte to something higher. And another camp that said, no, we should not increase the block size, or at least not anytime soon. And instead, we should do uh, this thing called SegWit, segregated witness, which is a, a cool technological trick that basically changes how the transaction is, is built and thus um, allows more transactions to fit in the same size of, of block. Or, you know, that's a, a reasonable analogy. It's not perfect. Um, so you have these two ideas, like one side wanting to do bigger blocks, one side wanting to do SegWit. And <laughs> a lot of us in the business community saw both these things and were like, hey, guys, both of these are good ideas. SegWit is great because it, it improves the protocol, it makes it more efficient, and it solves a bunch of bugs. Bigger blocks are also great as long as they're not too big. A modest increase in the block size will really help with short and medium-term scale. So why the hell don't we just do both of them? And this was... Um, I guess treasonous and heretical to to say it, but to most of the people in the business community, this was like the obvious thing to do. Especially because by doing both, you could actually get both camps, or you know, a large portion of both camps to to agree to the whole thing. So you can see it as a compromise, but I didn't because uh, in a compromise, 
you're actually getting like something worse than either side. In this case, I thought Bitcoin would be better than either side on its own. So um, a number of people got together and uh, the number was fairly large. It was, you know, several dozen of the leading crypto companies and almost all of the large Bitcoin miners um, and basically came together and said, okay, we all agree that we will advocate for both a modestly larger block. Uh, that's the two part of Segwit2x and Segwit. That's the Segwit part of Segwit2x. So do both of them. And um, that I felt really broke the standstill that had been going on for over a year. And immediately after that agreement, the miners started signaling for it, which which activated SegWit. So um, SegWit was activated on the Bitcoin network um, just before the Bitcoin Cash fork, mm. or just after, maybe. Um, so that happened. And <laughs> then uh, there was a period of a few months before the... the um, larger block size would be implemented. So essentially, even though this was a combination of activating SegWit and activating a larger block, SegWit came first and a larger block was going to come later. Uh, The problem was that after SegWit was activated, all the people that didn't want larger blocks then went into a frenzy uh, and started vilifying the whole initiative. Essentially, they already had SegWit, which they had been hoping for, and they didn't want the big blocks uh, in the first place. So then um, it put everyone kind of in an awkward place where those of us who wanted to to do this, you know, compromise uh, were vilified because we were, people said it was a, a corporate takeover and all this ridiculous propaganda. Um, <laughs> and so ultimately the, the conflict just got so full of vile and, and nonsense that, you know, any company that tried to speak out and, justify why it was in favor of this um was was boycotted and vilified and um it just got really bad and and ultimately you know rightly or wrongly the market did not want to go ahead with the the larger block so uh roughly two weeks before it was intended to activate uh, a number of us basically came together and said okay this is too contentious at this point um if this if this upgrade happens and it splits the network, there could be a protracted battle between sides here, and um, we don't want that to happen, so we're just going to call it off. And, of course, calling it off meant only that the larger block was called off because SegWit had already activated. Yep. So um, so that's where things stand. SegWit is activated. All the people that wanted SegWit to activate uh, kind of came out ahead. The people that wanted larger blocks didn't. And those people are largely the ones who have instead gone over to Bitcoin Cash. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the the lay of the land. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, when I when I read uh, your guys's um, decision to say, hey, we're not going to do this. I mean, I'm just going to do a quote here. It, it, I I personally found like it was kind of beautiful. You said, you know, although we strongly believe in the need for a larger block size, there's something we believe in that is even more important: keeping the community together. Unfortunately, it is clear that we have not built sufficient consensus for a clean block size upgrade at this time. You know, that it just seems like you're being reasonable. <laughs> so I don't know if that's yeah, you know, we, crazy, but <laughs> it it's, <felt> really... <laughs> it's really difficult when you're trying to negotiate or convince a mob. Mm-hmm. Um, there, are, there are just there are dynamics among especially anonymous people that do not have significant stakes in something mm-hmm. that change how a debate rolls out. Mm-hmm. It becomes very cheap, to, or very inexpensive to throw mud and very expensive to defend it Mm -hmm. or to defend yourselves from it. And in that environment, um, you know, who knows what the support of the larger block truly was when the agreement was done. Um, but because of the propaganda and because of how the mob was treating everyone and there is so much noise happening, uh, plus you had all the, you know, legitimate concerns from people who for, you know, intellectually honest reasons didn't want a larger block Mm -hmm. um thrown into that whole mob uh you really got to a situation where it was untenable yep Uh, so i think i i learned a lot of lessons about um how how groups of people that are this large work Mm -hmm. and how difficult it is to um to describe 
like an initiative when you when you have that many stakeholders yeah yeah i feel like and one thing that you said there about anonymity and like um inexpensive to throw mud but expensive to defend it feels like um some of this talib stuff around skin in the game where you have to you want to have the upside be the same as the downside and for these people if you're anonymous you're like you're less likely to have skin in the game and so i feel like I don't know. I, I want to make some of these kind of like meta rules that say, hey, if you want to participate in this, then you agree to these meta rules. And I guess let's use that as kind of a frame to talk. What we're talking about here in general is governance, how to govern these things. And, you know, whether it's that thing that I just talked about or whether it is who determines, you know, that, that group of people that got together, is that the New York agreement? Is that right? <laughs> Correct. Yeah, so that the New York agreement is just like, yeah, some group of people that got together to chat about this. And this is a big question, which is like, hey, who all should be in there to chat? Um, and, and there's no right or wrong answers to that. And so I guess, Eric, I mean, well, you know, what I think is like, I mean, how are you thinking about governance within the within Bitcoin? And, and what kind of governance structure would you like it to have going forward? Um, I think Bitcoin's governance is very clear at this point. Um, whatever the core developers want is what the mob rallies around. Uh, and that's not necessarily a judgment call. I think it's really worrisome from a decentralization perspective. But that's how things have played out. So every other stakeholder, from the miners to the business community to the users that disagree with with the core developers, all those groups who are all legitimate participants in the system as well, uh, have been systematically exiled or vilified away from the discussions and the decision making. And when they try to to help break an impasse, that turns into them being vilified. Mm -hmm. So at this point, Bitcoin's governance is what a couple dozen core developers want it to be. They they are in charge. Um, and we'll see how that plays out. I, I don't think anyone else cares enough at this point to even try to, um, to even try to refute that or, or protest it at this point. The people are very weary of the whole situation, mm -hmm. and so now it's really on those core developers. Like they're in charge. Um, we'll see how they how they build it, how they scale it, how they bring various parties together uh, in the ecosystem, because <laughs> no one else at this point. I think wants to even try anymore. Wow. Yeah, everybody's uh people are exhausted. <laughs> so I guess pretend though that the core developers were like, hey, we actually want to create a new governance structure or whatever that includes all these other stakeholders. What would you like I guess what would your optimal um governance structure be? I I don't know. I don't know how to design an optimal governance structure yeah it's a super tough question <laughs> yeah uh and i don't know that one should be i mean part of part of decentralization is uh a lack of formal governance structure um so even if i knew or even if i thought i knew what the correct one was i don't know that i would propose it <laughs> interesting interesting yeah uh so let, actually eric i want to talk about um what would so, so you've been talking about the core developers and and how they kind of can control the mob or whatever if you were to kind of play devil's advocate with yourself or if you imagine that one of those core developers or part some like leader of the mob was on the call right now what would they what would they be saying and what would they be would this be would this be able to be a good conversation or, or what what would what would their perspective be towards this um well to be clear, I don't think that they control the mob. I think the mob has thus far rallied around them. Mm. Um, to the extent that people who disagree with them just start leaving and working on other projects, I'm kind of curious what the mob will do because the mob will run out of, the mob won't have any villains and will then start perhaps looking internally. So I'm, I'm really curious about that. But mm. I think each... You know, each member of CORE is going to have a little bit different opinion on this. Some of them I respect very much, and I respect their opinions. Some of them I think are are really short-sighted and, and unhelpful to the discourse. Um, I, th I think that they, they are largely glad that the SegWit2x project failed 
even though now they have SegWit, which is what they had wanted for over a year. Um, I don't know if they recognized that that was due to the New York agreement. Um, so it's it's hard to say. You might need to to chat with them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like in in like you're saying they are not a monolith. <laughs> um, uh, and so yeah, different different parts of of the core developer crew have different opinions on this. So I guess I mean, another question that I'd love to ask here is. Um, so I come from a kind of a startup background, especially doing like coaching and things around communication and culture and empathy and what have you. And there's this great book called Developmentally Driven Organizations, um, which looks at organizations that are about kind of learning and honesty and things like that. And they use a metric in that book that says, um, you know, on matters of importance, like let's say the scaling debate, how often are members of your team from one through 10, how often are they frank and vulnerable when they like speak to each other, AKA how like honest are they? And then also one to 10, how like curious and empathetic are they in, in listening to the other people? Do you mm -hmm. feel like, I guess if you could give numbers for those, um, you know, how, how frank and honest are people from the speaking perspective and then how kind of curious and empathetic are people from the listening perspective? Um, the curious and empathetic throughout the community on all sides of this is close to non-existent mm. and that is a result of the the poison and toxic nature of the community how it's developed over the last few years so three years ago people were very curious and, and people could have reasonable debates and they would disagree and they would you know there's a certain uh, academic air to it or philosophical and uh, people were genuinely curious, and they largely felt that they were on the same side. Uh, it was, you know, crypto versus the status quo mm -hmm. of the banking industry. So all these people felt that they were allies and that they were all friends. And in that environment, people feel that they can be more vulnerable and they don't have to put up defenses. And they certainly don't uh, go around insulting each other and, and, tr and trying to vilify each other. Um Something that changed that, I think, is the the moderation policies of some of the Bitcoin forums. Mm -hmm. um, certain viewpoints stopped being permitted to be discussed, and eventually those were simply deleted or censored or removed from those forums. That drove a really strong wedge between uh, the different groups that had formerly been on the same team. And they literally formed other social media sites, you know, especially on Reddit, where they would then talk. And now you had two groups on different subreddits, all with groupthink in those local uh, communities. And that sets people up very much for an adversarial relationship. Mm -hmm. Now it was very easy to, you know, get to the top post of a certain Reddit by just shaming the other side. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um, that's what people spent a lot of time doing. Uh, so the the listening and empathy uh, fell towards zero. Yeah. So and, and and as you say that both the listening and empathy towards zero, and if you're trying to be frank and vulnerable and honest, a key part of that is being able to actually speak your voice. And if your voice is being censored, then then that is that means it's not being heard. And to double check here, yeah, you're talking about. Uh, r slash bitcoin as the more sensory one and r slash btc as the new one is that right yes and um to overgeneralize again our our bitcoin the the original bitcoin reddit mm -hmm. um is very much uh pro core developers at this point and our btc uh is full of all the people who have been exiled from the former mm -hmm. so um <laughs> the, the way that this would happen is someone you know, reversed a couple of years back and someone would say, um, you know, I think blocks should be increased for this reason. Someone else would say uh, a different size block is an altcoin, therefore not allowed on the Bitcoin subreddit. Mm -hmm. Therefore, due to our moderation policy, that post mm -hmm. will be removed. Interesting. And you could imagine how that would enrage someone. Um, and it, it just got completely ridiculous. And so, uh, you know, for a while, I, I tried to keep the community together and like point out that um, some of these moderation policies were really, really harmful. But um, I was pretty powerless to, to prevent that phenomenon. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's tough. I mean, because it, it comes from a place of maybe truth there, which is, hey, this is an r slash Bitcoin subreddit. Um, we, you know, we don't want to be talking about Ethereum here. Please take that to r slash Ethereum if you want to talk about Ethereum. But uh, it was clearly being used for, for more aggressive censorship things. I feel like, you know, I think about um, this great, there's this uh, the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And one of them is just like, seek first to understand and then to be, and then later to be understood. Uh, and mm-hmm. I feel like, yeah, I guess if, if you're listening to this and you're on either side of this debate, whether it's the BTC side, the Bitcoin Cash side, core developers, r slash Bitcoin, whatever, um, if you can if you can move your own personal needle to be a little bit more towards the seek first to understand, the be curious first side of things, I feel like that'll just be helpful for the community, right? <laughs> Do you agree with that, Eric? <laughs> um, yeah, and we're just way past that being uh... an effective point. <laughs> Um, it, you know, saying, saying that kind of thing is like telling a, a Catholic to, you know, be, uh, to be empathetic and understanding of a Protestant and, you know, before you even finish the sentence, they will have hung the person mm-hmm. for, for their sins. So, um, it's, I, I think it's just an unstoppable mob at this point. And the, and the real arbiter of all this stuff, the real way that governance works in this technology is the market. Mm-hmm. So if the market likes these other spin-off coins, uh, people will start using them more and they, they may gain dominance on the original Bitcoin. Yep. If Bitcoin cannot figure out how to scale, it will lose um, its first mover advantage and be replaced by others. Mm-hmm. Uh, ul- ultimately, all the argumentation and opinions of any individual person do not matter too much yep. and the market will settle it. But that, that happens over a long term. That's you know five or ten years. And meanwhile, people get people spend all their time uh, bickering with each other mm-hmm. so and you, let's let's stay on that in a second about more on the market side here I do want to just just say another version of this just for me looking at this R, you know the the BTC community versus the Bitcoin community and it feels like some of this like negative hyper polarized stuff that has also happened within America around Republicans and Democrats and mm-hmm. and it feels I don't know, and, and I'm reminded of this great site called High from the Other Side, which is a way to essentially engage in these kind of longer form conversations with someone from the other side, to see them as a human, to to uh, to, to to understand where they're coming from. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I just sometimes I get a little bit sad um, when I think, hey, at a very macro level, this is happening, and even in this thing that I'm participating in, you know, cryptocurrency generally, um, that that this kind of polarization can. Happen happen and people can start to become, you know, non-empathetic, non-curious kind of aggressive, aggressive people. So I don't know. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, it happens when civility breaks down. Mm-hmm. So I, th- I think among people who respect themselves and respect others, there's a certain level of civility and decorum in, mm-hmm. in discourse, even that it is appropriate and required, even when you disagree and perhaps mm-hmm. especially when you disagree. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people do not have that, especially when they're anonymous online. Uh, And perhaps the majority of people don't, right? So whenever a community gets large enough, it has enough of these people that just, they they don't, maybe they were, maybe they weren't brought up to appreciate that kind of civility. Maybe they have no idea what that even means, Uh, but they they get into the conversation and, and just very quickly, then you get polarization and these communities splitting apart, all of them hating each other. Yeah, I think and that civility and discourse point is I think is actually a really powerful one. And it was something that I personally was thinking about recently, especially on Twitter, um, and and how that civility and discourse, it requires more words and in Twitter forces 140 or 280 or whatever. And I was mm. trying to talk with I have this kind of weird, like I have these weird, like pledges to decentralize power. And one of them is about like gender and having more gender, you know, equality, especially within, uh, within the cryptocurrency land. And um, and I was going back and forth with this lady on Twitter about it because um, she was like, hey, shouldn't we just think of people as people or whatever? And I and I and I wanted to say, hey, thanks so much for your thoughts. You know, like we'd love to chat about this. But by the time I had said those kind of civility things, I wasn't yeah. able to. I was already at like one thirty-five or whatever. Yeah, it's a great point. <laughs> Twitter is an amazing tool, and I I love it. But I think you're totally right that when when you're restricted to that much, you there's no time to to politely frame something. Yeah. There's no space for it. Yeah. Uh, and, and Twitter has certainly been one of the mediums where the Bitcoin community has just torn each other apart. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so the people who are against 280, I'm probably pro 280. <laughs> um, so, well, with that, let's let's move to the kind of the side here of Bitcoin Cash. Um, and and there was this great article recently by Ryan Selkis or Ryan Selkis um, around uh, and 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 recently over I guess it was last weekend or a couple weekends ago um, this like thing where Bitcoin Cash was above the price of Ethereum for a bit. Um, you know, Eric, tell me about kind of some of the game theory here and how it might be the case that something like Bitcoin Cash could end up overtaking um, something like Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, so Bitcoin Cash absolutely could overtake Bitcoin. I don't think it will, but it is certainly a possibility. Mm-hmm. And again, it'll come down over the long term to the market. Um, but Bitcoin's value or any anything's value comes down to its its utility. So how useful is that thing? And there's a reason that Bitcoin took off, because it was really useful to move money across distances at very low cost without anyone being able to censor or stop that. Um, That was immensely useful, and uh, the world has been discovering it increasingly. Um, It has gotten so congested due to the scaling issue that the fees have gone up, you know, dramatically, you know, several orders of magnitude. A year ago, I was getting really worried about the fees because they were like 30 cents on average per transaction. They're now in the like three to five dollar range per transaction, and I, I think within six months they'll be more per av- more on average than a uh, than a bank wire. Mm. Um, because if if four people want into the transactions and no, there's only space for three, um, the, the bid the bidding to get into it goes exponential. It doesn't increase with. Um, mm doesn't increase linearly with use. It increases exponentially with use. Mm-hmm. So basically, uh, Bitcoin's usefulness for a larger and larger portion of payments is falling. It's never useful to use now for coffee. It's never even useful to send $10. And often, even $20 or $50 transactions could have a fee that's larger than the transaction size. Now, it's still incredibly useful if you're trying to send $1,000 or $10,000. I mean, there's no better way in the universe to send a million dollars to China than Bitcoin. Um, But as fees rise, you get a smaller and smaller subset of use cases. So as that happens, competitors that still have cheap transactions, such as Bitcoin Cash or Litecoin or Ethereum or Dash, um, these might start eking out market share in those transactions that are no longer useful for Bitcoin. And the extent of that effect is what will determine which which asset becomes the dominant one, right? So, so if another, let's say Litecoin, um, because it's so cheap to use still, and it has more throughput currently than, than Bitcoin, let's say it starts getting used for millions of transactions around the world, and it starts getting used so often by people that it now starts becoming more valuable than Bitcoin. Then Bitcoin starts losing its store of value property. So Mm -hmm. not not only has it fallen in its ability to do payments, it also is losing market share and and price to to a competitor. And you play that scenario out, and you can can see that something could totally overtake Bitcoin. Um, Again, I don't think that'll happen, but as these scaling issues go unresolved, the risk that it happens increases. And this is, and Bitcoin Cash is just the latest manifestation of this phenomenon. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. The essentially that utility. Right now, there's lots of speculative value, um, but underlying all that is the utility value, and eventually the store of value slash speculative piece will follow the utility value. So if Bitcoin right. Cash becomes more utility e, then uh, yeah, then it, it it very well should be the case that that it becomes the one that uh, more people are invested in. Yeah, so um, I guess to wrap up here, the final thing that's on my mind is I think that I wouldn't be surprised if some people um, that were listening to this um, are, were like, you know, coming back to the kind of this like the people side of things and the governance and the trust or whatever. Um, some of the people might be listening to this and listening to you talk and be like, oh, grr, there's Eric Vore. He's talking about things he can't be trusted or whatever. Um, how do you like – what would you try to say to people to say, hey, look, people, here are my, you know, here are my goals, here are my long-term goals, here's why, you know, you can trust someone like me, you know, like, why, what would you try to say to people to say, like, hey, I'm just trying to be a reasonable person here? (laughs) 
two two things one is um people shouldn't need to trust me or or shouldn't trust me mm. L- listen listen to my arguments and judge them on their own merit from a from a rational or emotional perspective regardless of who i am or what my intentions are you can listen to the words i'm saying and judge for yourself whether they make sense or not um and that's a that's a practice people should carry out on anyone that they're listening to um and two i mean I, <laughs> i've been trying to build bitcoin since most of the world had no idea what it was and was still laughing at it um my goal in all this is to replace the global fiat financial system with one based on crypto and hopefully that means based on bitcoin um that's my goal so that's what i'm looking at i don't care whether the block is one megabyte or two megabytes or eight megabytes i care whether the entire global financial system actually changes so that's kind of what has gotten lost in this debate. All these people who were allies in that original mission have now become focused on hating people that agree with them on 99% of things, but, but just the the specific path on which they want to scale Bitcoin um, means that, that they should be ostracized and vilified and exiled from the community. Um, I don't, I don't believe that's the case and I will always keep working to build Bitcoin into something better. Um, I like that. And And it reminds me of, this kind of conversational um, tactic that you can use where you say, when you're talking with someone and when you're disagreeing, you check and you say, well, what is your goal here and what is my goal? And you can kind of come to the point where you find alignment around something. And, And for you, almost certainly you have so much alignment with these other people in the Bitcoin land around trying to make a new system and, and replace global fiat and to make, give us the exit possibility um, from a global fiat system and, and that you're, you're very, very aligned with them and you're more aligned with them than with 99% of other people in the world. And so kind of starting from that shared place I think is helpful. And then you're kind of just dealing with some of those sub points um, down below. Yeah, except that in, in reality, if someone thinks I'm an enemy and wants to prove it, all they, all they do is they say, well, He runs a business. Businesses are trying to make profit. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what he really cares about is profit. Or maybe he's only working for his investors. So you really can't trust anything he says because profit. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, how do you argue with that? I mean, I am trying to make profit. I'm a profit-seeking capitalist. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, And that is not mutually exclusive with the desire to make Bitcoin huge. Mm -hmm. Um, But someone looking to vilify can really easily just always, you know, point to some uh, some stupid uh, some stupid incentive that they imagine that person might have that overweighs the one that that is obvious. Yeah, yeah, I think that's interesting. That yeah, as you say, you have you have the goal of you know Bitcoin replacing global fiat currencies, and you have the goal of you know trying to make money as a capitalist, both from your own crypto holding perspective and from like your own company perspective. And um, yeah, I think that. It's okay for people to be in companies. It's okay for people to try to make profit and provide value to the world. And it should be highly encouraged for people to be transparent around what those incentives mean. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And and Bitcoin was set up to work with the other incentives that people have. It is meant to be a a financial system for profit-seeking individuals. It is not meant to be some, some like, communal thing that that only – hippies who have foregone all desire for for material goods uh, mm-hmm. can use. Mm-hmm. Um, Bitcoin is the most radical capitalist tool that has ever been invented. And yeah. so there's a certain degree of irony in dismissing the people involved because they are also running a company. Yeah. Well, with that, Eric, thank you so much for your time today. Um, and I guess for anyone who's listening to this, um, if you're part of the the quote unquote other side here, um, I would love to have you on the show and to chat and and <laughs> and to try to be reasonable about these things. That's that's the macro goal here. Um, so yeah, Eric, thanks again so much for your time. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's been fun. Cool. Um, and if uh, you want to support me on Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash Rieslandmark. That's slash R-H-Y-S-L-I-N-D-M-A-R-K. Goodbye.